morning bright and early at 10 a.m. What better way to begin your Sunday morning than by discussing uh, about smart proteins, which is what the session is about today. Uh, so we are going to discuss a topic that is globally relevant, but particularly pertinent for India, feeding the growing population sustainably. As the most populous country and also a country which is specially vulnerable to the effects of climate change and environmental degradation, it is imperative for us to supplement current protein sources from animals with plant-based, fermentation-derived and cultivated sources of protein to safeguard against challenges such as antibiotic resistance, zoonotic disease, climate change and providing nutritious food to the population. Today's discussion across science, business and policy will aim to understand the unique opportunity that India has to lead the global transition to sustainable food systems while feeding its growing population, augmenting farmers' income, boosting the economy through exports and meeting its sustainable development goals. Moderating the panel, we have Sneha Singh. Please come on. The Dai Sneha. Acting Managing Director of the Good Food Institute India. The Good Food Institute India, GFI India, is the central expert organization, thought leader, and convening body in the Indian alternative protein or smart protein sector. Since its establishment, GFI India has been bringing together industry, academia, and government to come together to put India at the forefront of smart protein innovation. Through GFI's work with a community of partners, GFI India is articulating a vision for the future of food, one which stewards planetary health, tackles malnutrition, benefits farmers, and creates jobs for millions. GFI India is on a mission to build an ecosystem that can put sustainable, nutritious, delicious protein on every plate. Joining Sneha are our expert panelists for the day and the reason we are all here. In no particular order, I would like to invite on stage Dr. Manish Tiwan, Head Strategic Partnership, Biotech Industry Research, Assistance Council, Biovac. Dr. Diwan has a PhD from Jamia Hamdar and ICGED, New Delhi, in Pharmaceutical Sciences and Immunology. In his illustrious career spanning more than 25 years, Dr. Devan has worked with corporate behemoths such as Daichi Sankyo Life Sciences, Dabur, Randaxi. At Bayra, Dr. Devan is working at the research and entrepreneurship interface, interface to empower and guide emerging biotech enterprises with cutting edge innovations for commercialization and scaling. Welcome, Dr. Devan. Joining Dr. Devan is Dr. C. Anand Ramakrishnan. Dr. Anand Ramakrishnan is a renowned Indian food scientist. Currently, he is the director of CSIR, National Institute for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology, Trivandrum. He was formerly the director of Niftim Tanjavur. During his acclaimed stint as the director of Niftim Tanjavur, Dr. Anand Ramakrishnan had successfully implemented the Mission Onion program and Mission Coconut program aimed at the development of value-added products from farm produce. With more than two decades of experience in research and administration, Dr. Anand Ramakrishnan's scientific endeavors are focused on developing cutting-edge technologies with industrial and societal relevance. His pioneering efforts in the development of India's first indigenous food 3D printer and Asia's first engineered human stomach and small intestinal model system are the testimonials to his research excellence. We are also joined today by Dr. Jasveer Singh, head of AMETI Regulatory Affairs, IFF. Dr. Jasveer Singh, can you please have your stage? Dr. Singh obtained his master's degree in microbiology from Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar, followed by a doctorate from, bi from Biochemical Engineering Research and Process Development Center, Institute of Mi Microbiological Technology, Chandigarh. His area of research was enzy enzyme fermentations and industrial process development, and he is currently heading regulatory affairs for AMETI region, comprising of Africa, Middle East, and Turkey. 
and, in, and India at International Flavors and Fragrances, IFF. Prior to this, Dr. Singh worked in the areas of quality, food safety, and regulatory affairs with organizations like Mondelez, ITC, SGS, Food Research and Analysis Center, and Jagjit Industries. Jagajit, Jagajit Industries, my bad. He has also provided his expertise in lab quality management systems to the government of Vietnam as the technical export, expert for FAO. He is a member of various committees, task forces of both government as well as industry associations. Welcome, Dr. Jaswee. I would next like to welcome Mr. Abhishek Gupta, partner at Ernst & Young India, on the stage. Mr. Gupta co-leads the Economic Development and Advisory Business Unit at EY India. His areas of focus are investment attraction and facilitation, export promotion, startup promotion, and ease of doing business. He has 16 years of government consulting experience, leading large multi-year multi PMUs as well as industrial and sectoral policy engagements. Mr. Gupta has led more than two dozen consulting projects, projects related to landmark programs and schemes like Make in India, Startup India, National E-Governance Plan, Smart Cities Mission, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, and Skill India. Welcome, Mr. Gupta. And completing a panel today is Mr. Abhishek Sinha, co-founder and CEO of Good Dot. Good Dot is a pioneer plant-based meat company in India. An ex-IRS officer Abhishek left the service to start Good Dot to take India to the forefront of the global plant-based meat industry. Driven strongly by ethical foundations of plant-based meats, Abhishek believes that there is a better and more compassionate way to consume our protein through plant-based meats. I would like to thank Ms. Singh and all the panelists for joining us today for this discussion on smart protein, a climate solution to a secure and just food supply. I would now like to hand over to Ms. Singh. Thank you. Thanks, Asta. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's starting this morning, but uh, it's just for Sunday. Uh, thank you for joining us bright and early uh, panelists, speakers. Um, I will just add a little bit on to what Asta said around smart protein. So um, smart protein includes plant-based, fermentation-derived, cultivated uh, protein, and they have the potential to offer such a substantive um, environmental, um, social, economic benefits, as well as address nine of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And that's huge. Um, the very fact that smart proteins um, have cultural as well as sensory resonance to their animal-derived counterparts does set them really um, on an immense trajectory ahead. But also they use vastly less land, water, and energy, um, and significantly less um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in the spirit of World Food India, where we are today, um, the looking ahead and coming together of food innovation and path-breaking technology, smart protein emerges as a sunrise sector. By making meat from plants through fermentation or through cultivating them directly from animal cells, um, as Asta alluded, we can do a lot towards climate change um, and help our food system towards sustainability. Um, we're hoping that the innovations through the foods that we are talking about today we can slow down biodiversity loss, reduce pollution, and preserve our oceans. Smart protein or alternative protein is to meat and seafood production today, just as renewables is to energy. It is the future. And we have an enormous opportunity today to help us reach net zero emissions. Thank you to our panelists who have deep expertise across science, innovation, business, policy, and regulatory. And I'm really excited to deep dive into this panel and have some key insights at the end so that we know how India can tap into this smart protein opportunity moving ahead. And with that, I'd like to start off with pulses. So we all know India is the largest producer of pulses with approximately 28 million hectares um, under pulses cultivation in 2021. Um, it's also the leading producer of so many crops like millets, and rice, and wheat, and spices. Bringing these indigenously grown legumes, uh, pulses, millets, into smart protein products 
We hope that this will have several benefits towards biodiversity, but also farmer incomes. Um, we're also looking at how this can diversify the ingredient basket when it comes to plant-based proteins. So we're hoping that robust R&D and standard value chains can really transform India's indigenous crops as visible raw materials for the plant-based food industry. Um, so, I'd like to start off with you first. <laughs> um, you've done so much. I know Asta had a really illustrious introduction for you, welcoming you on stage. How do you think India can leverage these advancements in food processing to inform how indigenous crops can transform the inputs when it comes to this smart protein space? Not only what you mentioned about uh, Indian food industry, it's a government of India policy as well because uh, we wanted to make it a net zero, what you mentioned that, but for that protein also play the major role because most of the protein sources comes from the animal and animal is contribute a lot of the carbon dioxide emission. But we need a, each and every stage of the uh, cultivation to the pre-harvest, post-harvest and the tertiary processing. Each level we need a innovation need to be put in. Then only we can make sure people can come to the plant protein to make sure alternative to animal protein. If you look at that cultivation side or the selection of the crops, there it's a lot of constraints are there. Then extraction of the proteins, which are the extraction method we need to follow. If you look at the wet extraction, it has the advantage, precipitation, isolated precipitation, we can get the quality protein as no doubt about it. But it is energy intensive, water needed, and the cost also 2.5 times higher than the dry extraction method. For example, moon. If you go for the dry extraction, it's a better alternative than the wet extraction. Or we can go, go for the both combination of wet and dry. First you can do the dry, then you can go for the wet. So water intensity will be less, but still we can get the quality protein. The how you can play around the cost as well as the quality protein. This is the one thing we need to look into the extraction process. When it comes to the when you wanted to make a uh, plant meat or any alternatives, we need to texturize the proteins. What are the methods available with us? We know that well established method is the extrusion process, both low moisture and high moisture extrusion, we can do that. But is the only method can we go for the texturize the protein or any other method. If you go the texturize the protein, what is the temperature role? Can we have other than extrusion? For example, we developed the 3D printer, even that 3D printer was exhibited two days back to the Honorable Prime Minister. That 3D printer can be manipulated to textilize the protein. It's possible. That same extrusion line, you put the heater, one more heater, we can manipulate and we can control the temperature to textilize the protein and we can make sure how much you want to textilize the form, we can make it. That's a possible to do that. But we need a lot of input on that because this type of protein is a good amount of the fiber. When it's a fiber adder, when extrusion process, that will enters the the textilize the process. So how, what are the things we need to be taken care of? so-called ink, that uh, 3D print ink. If we have another alternative, if you go for spinning method. Spinning method is quite long time, it is available, but we are not able to make it an industrial scale of spinning method. Multiple head of the spinning we need to make the texturize the protein. How to put both spinning and 3D printing can help. First example, if you take the fat from the cultured meat, then you can add the plant protein. Both if you wanted to make it, spinning and 3D printing can help to make it. So such a technological intervention needed in the Texas is the protein itself. Okay, we make the protein is now available. Are we ready for this protein to go for the other things like, for example, quality of the protein? Why we are going for the, one is that as carbon dioxide emission or animal protein, but still we are not able to give exact precast value of what animal protein is give or milk protein is gives. Egg protein, you can't even match with any other protein except soya has come 0.9 close to that. If you go for the peanut protein, it comes 0.5 pedicats. How we can counter that? That we need to work out what are the methods are available to see that bioavailability or the solubility of this protein. So what are the methods we can improve the solubilization of this protein? Only thing we need to put up in the method, then we can able to make sure this protein has the high value product when we are going for the market. And people also convinced. You see, another protein is available with a high digestibility score, another protein only 50% of the why I have to take this one. See, whatever environmental things we are talking, so until unless we make sure our protein quality is improved, it's very difficult to move change the people mindset. So that, including the good food to all CSAR labs, left arms, everybody has the responsibility to work on that. We need to bring some particular proteins to make sure 
that level of going on there. And then bioavailability is another question mark. How much bioavailability of these proteins? This global protein. And the, see, if you look at the amino, uh, amino acid scores, everywhere how it is moves, the structural protein modification, how we are going to make sure. That also one should look at. What are the technological availability? And phytic, stanning, all these things, mm -hmm. anti nutrient factor comes into the play, this plant protein. It is not there in the animal protein or other proteins. But how to remove it? Is only a heat temperature, to increasing the temperature, heat treatment? Curve? No, it's not possible. Even 100 degree, you can't remove some of the anti nutrient factors. What are the other techniques? We can go for the non thermal techniques, for example, ultrasonications, or you can go for the cold plasma. Recently, we have done in the lift of cold plasma can help to reduce some of the despite content and that. So we need to couple these technologies along with the what are the existing technologies to make sure this protein has the really high quality protein. That's what each and every stage of the processing of this protein <coughs> need to be worked out and we need to make sure people have to understand yes this protein has the high quality. Then only they will come forward only talking about environmental impact yes everybody responsible for that but still cost proportion. Why now plant protein is coming up? Because earlier we used whey protein. Whey protein is cheap, we used. Now whey protein cost is increased many fold. That's what people are looking for alternative protein. But we don't have quality protein match with the whey protein. The flim forming behavior of beta lactoproblin, what is present in the whey protein, we don't have any protein with the plant or gene protein. So how are we going for that? Aggregation, is it a OH bond you can break and make the aggregation in the normal protein? No, we don't have such type of protein structure with us. So how we are going to make this small protein in the future of the world? That means we need to put a lot of scientific intervention to make sure such type of protein is available. Hope, good food India, I said already, everybody can work together to see that at least one plant, any plant, we take it and we'll work together, including the, for example, if you take the leaf protein and the seed protein or millet protein, leaf protein is difficult to take. If you want an example, it's Moringa. Moringa is the good amount of the protein, 7% protein. Can we be able to take the protein out? It's so very, very difficult because the fiber is such a level is bind to the protein. It's a solubilization, whatever isolated point you put it, you can't get the solubilized protein from the Moringa protein. That's a high quality protein, comes pretty cash by 0.7. But we are unable to do it. We are not able to do it. So this is the challenge in front of us. We need to put uh, programs and the scientific programs and all the research into that so we make it really happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think, sir, you just spoke about millets, right? So, India's crop and biodiversity, um, it's really primed to provide these inputs, raw materials into end products. Um, I have a stat to share. So, it's estimated that the global plant-based foods market, um, according to an April 2023 study by Bloomberg, it's estimated to be at 24.8 billion globally by 2030. Um, I'm going to pivot towards Abhishek right at the corner, this corner. <laughs> um, you're the co-founder, CEO of Good Dog. You've, uh, you've helped build a pioneer plant-based meat company. Products are everywhere on the shelves now, not just domestically, but also exporting now when it comes to Singapore, Oman, Canada, Nepal, the UAE. Abhishek, what have been your biggest learnings when it comes to um, what have been your biggest learnings when it comes to having experienced the demand for these products firsthand? And also, what do you think are the strategic interventions that can help companies like yourselves tap into this opportunity better? Thanks, uh, So, you know, we need to demystify the concept of smart protein. Essentially, it's a food item which you are consuming daily. When you look at, you know, maximizing and mainstreaming of plant protein, I think two things are extremely critical uh, is taste and price. So, you know, if taste and price would not have been the main criteria for mass consumers, McDonald's and Coca-Cola would not have been the name they are today. So, uh, that's that. those are the two very, very important pillars. If you get a good tasting product and you get a good price point, the mass market opens up. Very interestingly, a lot of you may not know, there's a texturized product uh, in the Indian market, especially in North India, which is called Soya Cha. And they have a market size of around 1800 crore per annum with no organized player. So why does that happen? Because people are looking for tasty and affordable food. Now comes the next part, which is the responsibility of, that's the consumer end of the domain, the mass market. 
when we talk about the companies who are responsible and who are looking to uh, you know, grow the sector more ethically, I think nutrition comes into the picture. As uh, Dr. Anand Ramakrishnan also said, soy has got a PD gas value of 0.9 and it's one of the most complete plant-based protein with all essential amino acid. And we are one of the largest producers and exporters of soy. So we have to leverage that product. So we have had that challenge, technological challenge of getting the right taste, right price point and the nutrition. So recently we have managed to really uh, pull on the price point. For example, six months prior to this, we had at a B2B level, our price point was around 400 rupees a kilogram. So think about when you compare with a mutton, which is around 600 rupees a kilogram, it is cheaper. What you, when you consider with chicken, which is around 200 rupees a kilogram, it's double the cost. So we are not making so much headway. Now we have developed a plant protein at a B2B level. Uh, we are showcasing at our event also 100 rupees a kilogram. And we are getting crazy orders. Because now everyone opens up. Because it is beca becoming affordable. So I do believe the most critical part in this debate to begin with will be technological for all the companies to get the price down, nail it down properly. And uh, in terms of interventions, uh, if you may ask, and very interestingly, it's not just a case of India. We have seen, even outside of India, when we talk to big retailers and brands, uh, they are looking for very affordable solutions. There's a lot of unemployment, inflation is high, so they are also looking for very affordable solutions. So, if we get a good quality product at an affordable price point, I think that's where the market is. Government, at a government level, imagine like we have to face around 18% of GST, whereas you know, meat products has got 0% GST. So if you imagine a 100 meter race, they already started at 18 meters and we started at 0 point. So it is a very nascent stage. If government wants to encourage, I think at least for the, we can have a free window of say three to five years of no GST on plant proteins. So uh, why the mass for the masses it is important and thereby it is important for government because all of us know we are the largest consumer, producer and importer of lentils. But very few people know 72% of Indians are protein deficient. And this imagine, why is that the case? All of us are eating dal, but we are protein deficient. Uh, for our body weight, we are not consuming adequate protein. Because if you look at the protein composition of dal, it goes from possibly 14 gram in chana dal right up to 20, mid 20 gram for other dals. But once you hydrate it, it's almost one third. You add water. So if I'm chana dal, I'm just having 5 gram in a consumable form per 100 gram. So to meet my body requirement, I have to eat a lot of dals, which none of us do. So that is why plant protein, which is more protein dense, closer to meat, will be important for meeting the nutritional requirement and protein requirement for India. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amshay. Um, I also feel like when it comes to um, the science of it, I know so you touched upon it a little bit. We're talking a little bit about how we can get to PDCAS values that are that are there. We've got uh, a very esteemed scientific expert uh, with us, uh, Dr. Devan, shifting shifting those gears towards uh, towards science. I'd love to talk about tapping into India's technological prowess. And uh, that's not just in terms of biomanufacturing, but also manpower. So um, smart protein as a category requires a lot of scaling up to be able to increase the production volumes to lower the costs. Um, this entails mobilizing a lot of capital. It also requires a lot of applied bioprocessing expertise to scale. So I know that the Indian biotech system has uh, proved its worth in terms of vaccines. And we've seen it not just in the past, but also with the COVID-19 pandemic that happened uh, recently and everybody looked towards India. So given that we have such well-established talent, we have production capabilities, how do you think Bayrat can support, incentivize, accelerate this innovation when it comes to venture building, when it comes to commercialization, um, to bolster a sector that is so nascent, that is emerging rapidly? <coughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. I think uh, the very reason Bayrek came into existence was uh, to fill in the unmet need where the biotechnology, which is the interdisciplinary sciences, can intervene and it can help translate the knowledge which is in scientific research institutions to translate, to make it tangible 
develop products, commercialize, and take it to the society for the societal good. Uh, you mentioned about COVID, and uh, we saw COVID pandemic. We had like four vaccines developed, made in India, and one billion people got immunized. Not only us, hundred plus countries also got benefited from what we what we generated as Make in India. So there is talent, there is uh, innovation uh, capacities in India. Similarly, I think this is an area where uh, uh, smart protein or cultivated uh, lab-grown proteins is is a requirement, and it's a uh, it has multifaceted uh, uh, significance. Some we just heard the protein content and replacement of protein content from let's say. Uh, natural uh, animal source to plant-based, but we've been doing it for years together. For example, uh, vitamin, vitamin B12, instead of having it from plant and fruit sources, we are now synthetically generating vitamin B12. And that, is, that has become very trivial. Everybody is prescribed you know, a vitamin supplement. So that is, uh, that is a protein. Similarly, insulin, uh, which previously animals only would use to be extracted for it. just a tiny uh, one gram of uh, substance. So you would uh, require several thousands of uh, animals. So likewise, I think the, with over a period of time, uh, the understanding of sciences has increased. We are now capable of uh, generating synthetic proteins uh, synth using synthetic chemistry viral, uh, sorry, uh, mammalian and uh, uh, microbial vectors and uh, ec uh, cellular ecosystem. We are now able to, can generate large numbers and large amounts. All therapeutic proteins, monoclonal antibodies are in that direction. It's just that those are single units, smaller, well-defined molecules. Here we are talking about those molecules in a more complex structure where taste, texture, flavor, and that satiety feeling, look and feel also comes into play. So it goes up. Uh, we can tick, pick it up. Uh, uh, the question that you precisely asked, like, is do we have a talent pool in the country, and how we can address this area? I think we do. Uh, there are uh, research institutions which are uh, attracting talent, and that talent is also getting nurtured in terms of PhD, postdocs and the master students handling equipment, learning the basic uh, molecular biology techniques. And all of them get employed, uh, use their talent to address this kind of unmet need. Bayek has set up incubation centers, uh, 75 of them. Uh, DBT, for example, has 16 autonomous institutions. All of them are nurturing this ecosystem of where the science is maturing. The translation side, where the science needs to meet uh, something on the plate as well as in the market, uh, we now have a deep tech startups into the ecosystem, close to about 6,000 of them. And this, among these, some of them have chosen this as the priority area to work on. And you would see that, like others, uh, they have also been able to compete on national merit basis and uh, uh, win granting aid support or equity support, funding support and some of the examples are here uh, and, and, and growing. This, this is a very small, small pool as, uh, as, a, as, a, as an area of not only national but international significance. I think collectively we need to upscale this pool of people who are working in this area, smart protein area. So one is the bottom-up approach. You get to choose what you work on, what you want to work on. Another is at an umbrella central level, we can kind of uh, identify and support and prime people. Here's the opportunity. Here's the national scheme. Here's the common excess infrastructure that has been built up. Uh, who are the takers? Would you like to come and address this unmet need? Realizing this, uh, we are now moving up uh, in a more emphatic manner uh, to support and scale the biomanufacturing. 
uh, uh, Pan India, and uh, DPT Direct has rolled out expression of interest uh, uh, from the for greenfield brownfield projects because you would notice that uh, as Dr. Anand was also mentioning, even this 3D printer has been created, but to harness its full potential, there needs to be further iteration, further customizations need to be done, right? So who would do it? Where would you do it? How would you scale, let's say, one 3D printer to, let's say, n number of mass production of those uh, 3D printers? So that common excess infrastructure where you require uh, outside the lab to pilot scale uh, as well as manufacturing scale setup. So that common excess infrastructure also needs to be seeded so that uh, people who initiate the journey in this direction can actually go all the way to commercialization. So uh, Bayrek and DBT has prioritized this gap area, identified this gap area, and now we are consciously seeding common excess infrastructure over and above the layer of incubation network. And for this, we have uh, rolled out financial support, uh, expression of interest from both existing CDMOs, uh, existing large, uh, large companies to uh, shelve out some space uh, for uh, as a as a brownfield project to cater to the requirements of uh, such uh, general. And uh, besides this, greenfield projects in this direction are also being considered. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Devan. And uh, we're very aware of, of what BIRAC is doing, what DPT is doing. I know that DPT has instituted um, a specific sectoral committee on, on smart proteins, and it, it covers all the modalities. It covers um, plant-based, it covers fermentation-derived cultivation, and even the regulatory aspect, which is so important, goes hand in hand. The so, DFI is also yes, part of the uh, national are. level stakeholder. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you for for bringing us onto the fold. Uh, yes, we are, and we're very honored. We're very privileged to be to be a part of this. Um, and I think, just as you said, you know, there's so much that we can do to accelerate, to innovate, but also look outward. You know, um, and actually looking outward, I'm going to look outward that way um, towards exports as well. <laughs> Towards exports as well, you know. I'm um, just gonna just gonna say some uh, some stats for context for you, Abhishek, before I dive in. But GFI India and Deloitte did an economic analysis that pre that predicted that the consolidated export potential for this sector for smart protein can range from um, 4,582 crores all the way up to 14,321 crores. Now that's huge potential. And uh, of course, that depends on several factors. It depends on government support. It depends on infrastructure. Um, even MOFP has, has, uh, has realized that there is this uh, potential. Um, and they've quoted it in the focus paper that they have on plant-based protein. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, Abhishek, I'd, like, I'd love to ask you, what, what do you think India can do, in your opinion, to tap into this economic opportunity for this sector? So let me just quickly start by sharing my experience in the government on how things will work and, and why there is a push for the government to take any particular step in, in a particular direction. So one, I think this particular part of smart food proteins, um, how the government would like to look at it is one, it is benefiting the farmers. Taste and price, Abhishek mentioned, I think for the consumer definitely taste and price is something which is without without uh, even thinking twice taste and price is going to work but for the government um, i think even environment frankly again sorry for being very brutally honest but i think environment would again be secondary benefit to the environment for the government for, for now will be secondary what is important is benefit to the farmers which will appeal to the government uh, nutritional element i think again abhishek and, and sir brought that out absolutely very important and thirdly does it help the national income which exports you spoke about I think these are the three elements which will drive the government to, to take some, you know, uh, transformational steps. Now coming to the exports, uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic uh, and again, um, sitting in various meetings of, uh, of senior level functionaries in the government, uh, there is a lot of focus on export promotion. Uh, there is a huge budget, um, I'm sure you will hear in the next budget, Government of India budget, that there is a lot of focus on exports. Now, within exports, I think what is important is that, uh, again, you spoke about some of the markets already. Uh, what is important is promotion of Indian brand. 
I think we need to create brand India and, and frankly Prime Minister also has been talking about this a lot. How do you create a brand for smart proteins manufa being manufactured and exported from India? That is most important. Why would the world accept uh, the products coming from India, especially you know, such if I may use the word uh, 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 well researched, developed, uh, nutritionally enriched. So therefore, uh, what is most most important is that we create a brand for ourselves, and that's where organizations like Apida, I'm sure they're already making efforts. But I think that is that is part one. The second part is creating awareness among our MSMEs and exporter community. I think that's another huge area because you you can't just talk about top hundred exporters. You have to make sure that you know the MSMEs in the country are also very well aware because they are very well connected with you know it's, uh, importers and and buyers from across the world. So getting the MSMEs into this entire circle of making them aware. I think Sir has already spoken about infrastructure creation, common facilities, infrastructure. That's a fantastic step which has already been taken. Um, and then the farmer community. Again, I think awareness creation, there are a lot of digital interventions by the government where they are directly connecting the farmers with the buyer community or with the exporters or with the international community. I think if we even if we make the buyer, the farmers aware, which is where again the Ministry of Agriculture comes into picture. So I think that perspective of export uh, definitely needs to, to bring all of this together and, and promote it further. Thank you so much and I think uh, one piece that even we've, we we think is quite complex but, but definitely plays a huge part of, uh, of the puzzle that we're trying to solve as well is the farmer linkages. Uh, we're a complex <coughs> country, we have lots of uh, different states, different crops, um, backward linkages to farmers and how this can directly uh, benefit farmers is a huge part of our learning journey at, at GFI as well and how uh, at GFI India we can do better to build those linkages, understand what those uh, models are and create those linkages uh, directly whether we, we need to do any research on it, whether we need to partner up with, with organizations who are doing that work on the ground and, and get intelligence and expertise from experts like yourselves and move in that direction. I think that's definitely something that, that I agree with you, we need to be doing more. Um, thank you so much for your, uh, for your views there. And, and I think the one last piece, but very crucial piece also that, that uh, is a part of this uh, value chain almost is the, is the regulatory aspect which is without which it's incomplete, it doesn't really reach the consumer without, without passing through regulatory, uh, the, the regulatory channels. Um, we know that FSSAI, Apex Food Regulatory Body um, for India is driving this forward in terms of looking at innovative food categories like smart proteins and, and keeping consumer safety in mind whilst looking at the framework for these products as they slowly, slowly inch towards the market. I know the plant-based uh, meat and foods market is so much more mature. Um, again, I'm, I'm doing some more stats here, but I'd like to just say that as per a 2019 study, uh, we saw that 63%, nearly 63% of Indians were very or extremely likely to purchase plant-based meat and 56.3% um, Indians were again very or extremely likely to purchase cultivated meat. Um, with the recent approval that we've seen in the US for cultivated meat which has followed on the heels of Singapore, um, it's really evident that more geographies want these kind of products accessible to consumers. Um, and that includes regulatory pathways, regulatory frameworks to be working hand in hand. And we have uh, Dr. Jasveer, uh, he's been heavily uh, involved in the regulatory landscape and also the smart protein ecosystem, sir. Um, I'd love for you to talk to us and the audience a little bit on how the FSSAI can streamline its regulatory processes for an emerging innovative category such as smart proteins and make it more accessible to consumers. Thanks, uh, I have. Yeah. Um, so when, uh, and metaphorically speaking, typically when you talk about uh, uh, high science kind of uh, products or businesses, it is typically the regulatory who has the last word. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> see, when you look at regulations, uh, you need to look at and also keep this thing in mind that if you evaluate the pace at which science develops, 
and the pace at which society is able to understand that science, these two are at very, very different levels. The society understands science at a much slower pace than the science actually develops. And the challenge becomes even more complicated that the regulators understand it even more slowly. <laughs> so, uh, but then there are valid reasons for that. Because the whole intention of a regulation is to stand as a sort of a guarantor in terms of product quality, in terms of product safety or whatever else. Right? And the regulator has to establish that. And as an analogy, uh, consumer acceptance of any product is much higher when they see that that's being already approved, considered to be safe by the regulator. Right? So the regulatory decisions play a big role in deciding the acceptability or success of products of this kind. That's one. Uh, the other part is when we talk about the Indian regulatory ecosystem, which is FSSAI that you mentioned, uh, generally when we look at it from the side of a business, uh, what do we expect FSSAI to do? Right? We do want them to create processes and frameworks which are quite predictable. We, where we know that, okay, this is what we are supposed to do. That means the criteria for compliance or what constitutes compliance is absolutely clear to everybody. So that when you start with a business, you know what kind of data needs to be generated and that need, data needs to go to FSSAI and the processes are so predictable that you know that if you are able to give this data, the product or, or this material will automatically get approved. It will take a bit of time of evaluation, etc. So that's one expectation and that's where I think FSSAI can play a role right now because uh, fortunately this is an area Uh, fortunately, this is an area uh, which is coming up. We have the liberty of having some time at our disposal where we can look at what are global best practices, what are those things that we can learn from uh, other geographies or other regulators on how these kind of products, whether these are cultured meat or, or other kind of product, how they need to be evaluated. What is the basic principle which should form the basis of that risk assessment? Right? So, uh, this is uh, again an area where FSSAI can build capacities before somebody actually applies to get an approval for say a cultured meat or those kind of uh, uh, products. The businesses will be uh, quite happy to know that the regulator is ready with their processes and requirements when they actually want to launch a product. You can save some uh, amount of time there. The other part is that uh, uh, we also need to create a bit of knowledge exchange uh, platforms so that things do not come as a surprise. Both, I mean, at the uh, when we say. FSSAI or the regulatory authorities need to engage with global bodies. The businesses also need to look at how these things work globally, what are the requirements for a product approval to happen in those geographies and be ready to meet those kind of requirements. So that knowledge exchange platforms uh, need to be created both at the regulatory level as well as at the business level. And, and then the third uh, area which is uh, which probably is going to be much more important in this space is about consumer information because uh, and globally already some of those noises have started emerging that uh, uh, can you call a product a meat when it is actually not a meat although you are calling it as a meat alternative but can you really call that? 
those are kind of debates which have already started those are kind of debates which are heavily dependent on consumer understanding in a particular country in a geography and that's an area where businesses also need to be cautious and uh, they need to look at the societal understanding so that these things do not become uh, sort of avoidable roadblocks in in future when the businesses attain a certain degree of scale and thank you thank you so much i have a follow up question on the on the um, geographies i'll come back to you with that on on other countries uh, having road maps and how we can build networks but before i go there i think we've been talking about economies of scale we've been talking about how we can this is a nascent sector we need to be better we need to grow and i think we have two uh, voices here who can talk a little bit more about economies of scale um i have this question both for you dr divan and also for you sir um what do you think are the kinds of multi stakeholder partnerships that can really be put together to ease the bottlenecks that we see uh, in an emerging sector like this whether it comes to product development whether it comes to incubation looking at the supply chain i'd love to hear both your thoughts Rightly <coughs> pointed out, uh, actually, what Abhishek has said, India is almost 16% of the population still faces the protein deficiency. This is one side. Another side, still we are importing the small protein. We are the highest amount of the production of the grains, almost 380 million tons of the food grains we produce. Still, we are importing the proteins. This is the what we need to have a clear uh, scope is there for India to explore the good protein. That means. We need a technology intervention required for our own crop because we are biodiversity very large. So we need to identify which is the crop we have to promote. One is that soya. What they have done? Can we do that with the millet? Pearl millet. If you take it, is the uh, everything is very good in the protein, fiber, almost about 10 percent, including if you see the glycemic index of the pearl millet, it comes almost 50 plus. So why we can't push it such a way to make sure this protein will be performing better? Economics. If you are telling yes. growth rate of indian food industry if you look at is a phenomenal growth rate now we are predicting 535 billion in another 2 years time and only sector last 10 years almost 10% of the growth rate is achieved by the food industry if you look at ready to eat ready to cook product is almost growth rate last 3 years 35% and all the food industry will agree with me all are in the like a honeymoon time last 3 years they are very good business they made it in the thanks to covid because of that it is the uh, growth rate is gone that much but where is our smart protein place in the that that's what we need to see that how best we can capitalize this market gap so we need to identify where is the bottleneck we need to move on to that second one is that what we have done it for the millet just year of millet declaration was not aware of the common people now because our government has taken such a initiation it moved i was the chairing the committee for the introducing the millet to the pillai scheme We made it 10% to 50%. If we add any form of the millet, you get the incentives from the KLS scheme. Like that, we need to push it to the government to make sure even 10% or 20% of the plant protein if we add it to the existing product. That's what we need to go step step by step. So when incentives like that, people will come forward to do it. Not only the PLI scheme, we can go for PMFM scheme, any scheme, unit scheme. If somebody goes for the extraction, because this need a lot of technical intervention. It has the both the side if you have high technical intervention the competitions all always very less that's what he is telling only one person was community that's the truth because high moisture putting that type of extrusion getting the meat is not easy only build a five crore capital investment who is going to put it so in such a case we need to give a lot of incentives from the government side we need to push it one side ministry of processing industry one side agriculture department again appeal so we need to put all together good food india can take such a lead we need to submit the white paper where is the gap analysis how much market potential how much we can export how much employment generation can give only for protein segment that's what we need to identify we need to work on these three verticals then things may move on for the compact incubation virac is doing wonderful but some of the institution western country already started smart protein incubation already is there one or two couple of institutions they started so why not we can think about at least one center of excellence in our country then some of the incubation centers two three institutions then we can go innovation labs are thinking where we can start this is the protein how you can modify the structure this protein can be digested to score can increase even 0.1 in 
it's going to be good improvement. So that's the level we need to move on. So many food technology institutions in the country. We can start the thinking lab on that. Identify some of the protein sources. We need to push it in the each and every direction. Then we can interlink thinking lab to the innovation center, innovation center to the incubation center. We can bring it to the center of excellence. Then things can move in that direction. Or say policy intervention, or say technological intervention, both can complement each other. Maybe another five years time, we can stop importing the smart protein, we can export the smart protein. That's what we need to think about. No, sir, absolutely, that would be exactly absolutely. And I think this, the model of center of excellence and the model of trying to have dedicated research and acceleration incubation that is focused on smart protein is definitely need of the hour. As, as you see, it's being prioritized around the world. It would be great if just like when there is that prioritization, there is that focus, you see things move, things happen. So I'd love to pass on to Dr. Devan for your thoughts as well. I'll uh, second that uh, what Dr. Anand said, but I'll complement a uh, few other things uh, just to highlight. For example, we talk about <laughs> commerce, activity, conventional, agriculture. Uh, so where BIREC and DBT intervenes is where there is an IP-led technology being made. So if the proteins or the food is made in the lab, I think that is where we would pitch in and support. And the conventional uh, activities, are, I think, by several ministries and departments uh, are, are being led. So uh, uh, within that innovation ecosystem, uh, we've been supporting through, let's say, uh, risk mitigation of the early stage innovation. Uh, through ignition grants, which gives 50 lakh rupees to an individual, individual or a startup or a PI, even non-affiliated with a with an institute. So he can go and work in an incubation center anywhere in the country, and then uh, develop the ideation idea to all the way to proof of concept. So this is fundamental to see such innovative programs and innovative projects which can eventually cater to the, uh, the desired market or desired future of replacing or partly comp uh, complementing the protein requirements or the food nutrition uh, and then synthetic biology. Uh, at present, uh, Biorec DBT kit is only handful and we've been catering to all the biotech sector, including this one. So I think one fundamental requirement is that we need to come together, uh, like-minded uh, institutions like, let's say, Good Food Institute, which is doing this on a mission mode. Some industries, some ministries, they can come together and allocate some budget to support this innovation right from the bottom level up. So today, if we are giving five biotech ignition grant awards to five of these uh, people who are working in smart cooking area. Tomorrow we can do 25 in each call. I think that will upsize the pool of the more shots you throw at a target, you know, higher is the probability to get the success. So that's one. Uh, second, uh, as I mentioned that uh, for them to move up beyond the laboratory so as to be uh, to reflect the, uh, the asset value in piloting and validation and then manufacturing, that requires a much larger infrastructure beyond the capacity of an incubation center or an institution. For that, again, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we are reaching out to the industry who already have that infrastructure or intend to invest in this segment and see newer infrastructure. So that's more like a greenfield project. So that uh, uh, projects which move up the value chain of technology readiness level, they not only are able to attract uh, angel VCs funding, but the industry traction to further forward pull. Third thing, I think we touched upon the regulatory. Uh, I think we need to sit together on this. The innovators, the regulators, uh, and the enablers, we need to sit together and also prepare ourselves for the innovative products, how we would be able to handle that, what would be our policy framework, what would be the requirements that are needed, so that individual project leader would be able to build in right in the pursuit of uh, progression, so that tomorrow when he comes 
uh, he or she comes that this is my product, I need approval, they would say that it has these many gaps, it doesn't uh, mean so this, uh, this activity is critical and I think uh, as uh, Mr. Jaspir also mentioned that uh, we are at the, at the equal footing at the world level, just like party cell therapy, we have also become one of the few countries uh, which have party cell therapy manufacturing. Same way, smart proteins uh, moving into that domain, we are also right there and we can catch up with the world. So we can build that regulatory policy framework which is facilitated and progressive in the manner that newer drug discovery regulations uh, work closer with the innovator right there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Saran. And I think that, like, uh, it's such a huge point. I'll uh, I'll I'll take that forward uh, in terms of your suggestion for the regulatory input as well. And I'll I'll uh, come to Dr. Jasveer on my follow-up question. Um, so the regulatory processes for this category for smart protein and smart protein being the the um, cultivated meat, plant-based meat, fermentation-derived protein. They're rapidly changing um, and they're evolving as we speak. The FAO WHO report on cultivated meat safety aspects called upon regulators recently to generate a safety assessment data based um, on the risk assessment framework. Um, the FSSCI also has existing MOUs with several regulatory authorities which are actively involved in Codex. And it's uh, Codex's uh, 60th anniversary this year as well. Um, the APAC region, I know you were talking about global geographies before, specifically the APAC region has formed such a consortia to bring about coordination, to bring about dialogue when it comes to um, data generation and data exchange on regulatory frameworks. How do you think the FSSAI can collaborate when it comes to international regulatory bodies and organizations so that standards can be aligned and there can be harmonization across the globe? Uh, I'd love your thoughts on that. So uh, this, this word harmonization is used in so many different ways in regulatory discussions that uh, at times uh, you really need to dig deeper into what does it mean. Uh, does harmonization mean copy paste? Does harmonization mean things which are aligned? Does harmonization mean things which are not in conflict with each other? Right? And all these three different ways of looking at harmonization uh, can still be used uh, to describe the word or mean the same word as harmonization. Right? So, uh, one of the, uh, the areas which have gained real attention, uh, particularly after WTO has been formed, is to reduce the regulatory burden or reduce the cost of compliance to businesses. Uh, and that's not only for India, but all across the world. So it becomes very important for governments to engage with each other so that the reputation of certain things can be avoided. And that should be the objective of harmonization in, in my view. If a material has been assessed to be safe by one uh, country, the system should be such that it will be deemed as safe in any other uh, country. right? So that businesses do not have to undergo the same process of seeking approvals when they expand when this, like uh, Indian companies, they have taken an approval from FSSAI if they want to export to any other country, there the FSSA approval should automatically give them a much faster access to the market. That's the, in, the ultimate objective. Right? Now, how you can achieve that is when you build a similarity in processes. So, the safety assessment of any such product is based on a process which we call as risk assessment. That has fundamentally three components. One is you identify what is the hazard, then you characterize that, and then you undertake an exposure assessment, right? And then the communication part of it. That's, those are three pillars of that. 
identification of risk and characterization of risk these are scientific domains these will not vary when you move from country to country like a safety assessment say for a material is built on animal studies the data on animal studies can come from any country it remains the same what really varies is that what is the degree of consumption of that product in a particular country and that's where you see differences in approaches between countries cropping up so the harmonization is built on standardizing these portions of safety assessment and then bases the consumption levels of materials in individual countries you can look at a slight bit of difference in that right so that's how you can build in a standardization and harmonization in uh, ensuring that there is a faster access to market and now wto has given recognition to certain standards so wto recognizes codex as the reference standards when it comes to foods so india is already uh, a very active uh, participant in all these codex discussions and uh, codex keeps on building these framework so what really needs to be done uh, i think partly it is already being done that india is actively engaging with codex now what india because it is looking very uh, aggressively in this uh, sector we ourselves can lead some discussions in codex to build a harmonized framework which can be adopted by uh, all the countries right so that's one approach which can be uh, taken up the other is uh, a country to country uh, uh, sort of engagement which we say mutual uh, recognition agreements uh, which is another approach to be taken up the third is multilateral which can be taken up at a regional level right so these are various approaches which uh, which are possible and uh, in some of them the regulator is already engaged uh, if we can build a little more structure to that and a defined objective to that i think that'll be a great help and a step forward for this sector thank you thank you so much um i also feel like coming back um uh, to to domestic markets and and consumer demand a little bit i think there's so much that we can do to scale there are regulatory frameworks that that can support us along the way there's the scope for innovation we have the talent we have the infrastructure but there's a lot to also think about when it comes to the consumer demand piece and the category itself and i know uh, abhishek on this side um uh, you've done a lot when it comes to um the the micro markets in india and accessing these micro markets in india when it comes to smart protein products plant based meat products in your case um how have you gone about improving this category awareness and and the penetration when it comes to the variety of micro markets in india so as i said you know uh, the basics remains the same and just uh, the rest of iterating the same points uh, i say that taste and price you know most people take your own example when you go out to eat you are you can splurge a bit your mentality is to spend a bit more money but when you are having a grocery on a daily basis you always compare so even say for a brand like say premium meat brand like delicious right uh, may have you know some challenges changing habits where you know, people have to pay a premium to get meat so same goes for plant based protein and when you talk about india uh, i think uh, we are much more price sensitive in our you know Uh, monthly consumption. So uh, those were the pillars we worked upon. Uh, thankfully, uh, we had a distribution partner which was penetrating to the rural markets of India. So we are, if you look at our top ten cities in September where we sold, you'll have some you know interesting sounding names: Samastipur from Bihar, Vishakhapatnam, Bhuvneshwar, Malkangiri from Odisha. So these names uh, you would not associate primarily with a plant protein consumption. Think about Samastipur. The people there are consuming plant protein. but we are not telling them in so much man we're just saying it's a tasty quality product this have it so i think that is what the future of the market will be uh, because uh, yes these are there are technical matters to it but food is very individual and very cultural so uh, if you look at and i i believe the smart protein mainstreaming in india will be in the raw format if you look at the meat consumption also it is always in the raw format people buy 
raw mutton, chicken, fish, and they cook it as per their own cuisine. So, ready-to-eat market will be concentrated primarily into the urban sector and the exports. And in coming to exports, uh, you know, it's it's very fascinating. There's this company in America called Just. So, Just, uh, you know, they came up with a vegan egg alternative. And how do they market it? They say that we scanned the entire globe and we came with an ancient Indian lentil called Moo and made protein out of it and made uh, egg out of it. So, okay. Americans know how to brand their yeah, stories. America, we do not. While yeah. even during our you know, pre-independence days, we would export cotton and import textiles because there is no value addition in, you know, in cotton. So, this is what we are doing even today. We are exporting uh, lentils or you know, soy. Why don't we export value added product? We, uh, we export our soy, they yeah, process yeah. it and they send us the smart protein to India. So what's the point? We are as technically competent, as resource capable as the western world. In fact, we should be exporting out of India. And uh, India knows its spices. You know, an Indian format of plant based being going out from India can have such a major market. Think as if, you know, a French company selling, say, Indian butter chicken. No one will buy even in India. And same goes if you sell, say, a burger or a nugget from India to the US, people may not be so excited. But if we sell, uh, you know, curry, plant-based curry, plant-based tikka, plant-based biryani, then that becomes authentic. So there is how we have to leverage our agricultural strength and our culinary strength. I think that is going to be the future of plant protein. And it has to be changed as per the domestic consumption in the raw format and the finished function in the export format. So this is our thought. Thank you. No, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think another piece to this puzzle is also the PPP model. When it comes to actually, I know you alluded to also doing partnerships and, and bringing people around the table. There's also so much that we know and, and I'd love uh, uh, Abhishek your views on that. You know, you've worked on the so many sort of smart cities, you've worked on Startup yeah. India, you've worked on Make in India. Yeah. What are the unique strengths and challenges when it comes to uh, driving these large scale initiatives yeah. and, and really, you know, ex exploring what we have in terms of our scope yeah. in India, as Abhishek was just alluding to? So, um, I think first hand Thanks to Abhishek, he brought, brought that point out about branding India and the Indian products beautifully. Uh, that's precisely, I think, what we need to do if we need to promote our exports. Now, coming to the point about partnerships, and we spoke about multi-stakeholder engagement. See, I'll be very honest to you, and I don't want to be a show spoiler here. When my experience of working with the government, uh, there are so many ministries involved here, or so many stakeholders involved. There's Ministry of Agriculture, there's Ministry of Food Processing, there is FSSI, which is another ministry, uh, and of course then there is DGFT or other agencies from an export perspective. <laughs> exactly. So, yes, they will never come together. Um, uh, again, sorry, but this hasn't happened in the past. At least I'm talking from experience. Uh, what is important is that, uh, and the second thing, sorry, let me, let me also tell you the second thing. Government to release monetary incentives or plan monetary incentives is another matter, uh, which again is going to be super, super difficult. I think what we need to do, and we need to play it smart here, one, the government will be ready to play uh, sport if we talk about non-monetary incentives. And when I say non-monetary incentives, uh, it could be about branding, it could be about promotion, it could be about research, it could be about startup, uh, it could be about farmer uh, welfare initiatives, it could be about MSME development, but rolling out monetary incentives, very, very difficult. Now, this is where even agencies or institutes like yourself, GFI, would play a huge role. Let the respective ministries do their own parts. Uh, do not think that they'll talk to each other and come to a common forum and then they'll engage. No. Let food processing talk about processing uh, through the MSME. How do we engage with the MSME to promote this concept of production? Thing? talk about efficiency, talk about return on investment, so that the MSM is getting it. Let the Ministry of Agriculture and APIDA talk about farmer welfare, as well as uh, the export component. Uh, let BIRAC, DBT bring up the, uh, the research component, uh, the startup, the innovation, the incubation component. Let agencies like FSSAI, which is Ministry of Health, 
let them go into the regulatory aspects. That is when you need to be the facilitator. You are the common thread. And if you make all these things happen um, with these all these respective ministries, I think there's definitely a way ahead. Just for the I wish I'll say. Uh, so Abhishek, uh, you faced, uh, painted the uh, present picture. Uh, but I think uh, we also need to aspire. जो नहीं होता है उसको भी करना है। अगर नहीं बात करता है डिपार्टमेंट्स मिनिस्ट्री, so we can bring them together. And I think एक बार भी नहीं होता, we need to do it again and again. And somebody neutral has to champion it. Coming back to GFI can play the anchor role. So in we are organizing Global Bio India in December, fourth to sixth December, same place here. Here and uh, the next door, call number 14. So, right in the first day itself, that's a large congregation of entire biotech ecosystem of the country and reflecting both at India level as well as outside India level. So, on the first day itself, we are keeping a session where we are bringing all regulators, different kinds, uh, so on one room and let them talk in the closed door. Somebody can moderate that session and how to facilitate and get prepared to handle innovations. So it is ahead of the rule, but I think very critical that we talk now and identify the action points so that there can be a framework developed and tomorrow when people like you develop those proteins and reach out, there is somebody to say uh, data access, patient access, a consumer access, a safety data, the HIA, and HIA. So I invite, uh, I think, uh, all the participants there uh, to, and that would be follow, followed up with the uh, open house, where the startups can ask questions and innovators can ask questions. Thank you. Uh, just like to add, Niti uh, Ayo could be another uh, facilitator, okay, along with the first GSI. Because they are sort of neutral to, uh, you know, how the government would function. So they could be another stakeholder who could bring all these stakeholders together. So we may want to knock that door as well. Yeah. All great ideas. That's the, that's the whole point. And we also have Apita, who, who can also help and, and facilitate this process. We've got, uh, we've got so much that we've learned from the panel today in terms of uh, different thought ideas. And I'm, I, I'm not able to make notes, but I know I have... Uh, I have team members in, in corners of this room who are who are viciously making notes because all these kind of ideas and so what you said that if we work now, if we think now, we can be ahead of that roadmap. I know Dr. Jaswi also indicated that, that, that if we are ahead and we are doing the work now, we can start building that roadmap and, and understanding what the white spaces are. Um, one point we didn't touch upon in this panel was a little bit on investment. Uh, we did a little bit in, in terms of the government investment, but I know that generally um, when it comes to, um, and, and I know that at World Food India, we've been talking about that sustainable food solutions are the emphasis for the government as well. And there needs to be more investment. Um, over the last decade or so, uh, it's only been 14.2 billion USD, that's the GM mobility, to also find some of that from the private investment space, from the VC space that also comes into um, into smart protein and alternative protein as well. So we're optimistic that um, that might happen in due course as well. Um, I'm, I'm very, very wary of time. So I just want to go one around the house and say, from this panel, from what you've heard from uh, everybody over here, what's the one thing that makes you most optimistic about the smart protein sector as we move ahead? Um, should we start from you? Um. The nutritional aspects, I think that's where uh, our country would really, really, really like to have, uh, to, to give a push to this sector. I think the nutritional aspect is something which really excites me when we talk about uh, I think we have committed, we have said it in open, that uh, biomanufacturing is the way that will lead uh, our nation in the future, and smart proteins and fake biology is critical function, function of that. So we are committed. No, and thank you so much. I'd love to like just recognize that again and, and being a part of that journey on the biomanufacturing policy with, with the DBT, with Bayrak has been very enriching, very humbling for us as well. And whatever we can do to support that, we will continue to do as, as GFI India. Thank you, sir. Collectively, we have to yes. make that happen. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, of Hopefully, as you said, sir, aspirationally, we will talk about it. 
So your thoughts, what makes you most uh, optimistic? Definitely we wanted to World Food Factory. We wanted to send our food to every corner of the world. That is our dream. And in that, definitely food ingredients market wanted to make it a large hold on that. Definitely smart protein plays a bigger role into that. So that's what I looked into that when our businesses grows, food ingredients market, spices and all, what you seen, everything here, almost 50% of market share. So maybe smart protein also plays a critical role into it. That's what I looked into. Non-regulatory area, but uh, I think uh, what makes me really optimistic is these youngsters. I'm sure the capabilities that they have, uh, they'll be able to do much more what we couldn't do in our times. So I would like to couple two things. <clears throat> what Abhishek said and Dr. Anand said, coupling them gives me a lot of hope. Of course, we are doing what we can at our own level. One is the nutritional requirement and second, if uh, our Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, if he just declares it a year of smart protein, I think all the collaboration will come in place. We won't have any challenge. Yes. Thank you so much. That is a, that, that's the, that's a wonderful note. I think, Abhishek, uh, we at GFI India have been trying to encourage and make, uh, you know, headway into these kind of conversations with all around stakeholders. So we work across science, business and policy. We're a true ecosystem builder. We want to go into this mission more. We recognize and see what the International Year of Millets did for the millet industry. And that sort of played such a key, key role even when it's plugged into the plant-based, um, you know, the plant-based protein value chain. It's also done so much for visibility, so as you said, for millets as well. So there is so much opportunity that if at the highest levels, this is recognized like it's being done by the DBT, by BIRAC. I think once it gets that recognition, once there is a year of uh, of year, year of smart protein, that would be amazing if that happens. Uh, and I really hope we get to see that. And I'm truly grateful to share the stage with, uh, with all of you who are just as interested, excited, uh, invigorated by this and optimistic as me uh, in this journey. So thank you for joining me and thank you audience for being such a wonderful occasion. <laughs> The stage we have the organizers have certain gifts for everyone. Uh,